Today, we'll be talking about alternating hemiplegia of childhood. The major symptoms found in this condition are found in the name itself. So it's a childhood onset disorder where we have hemiplegia or paralysis of one side of the body, either the left side or the right side that alternates. So between different episodes of hemiplegia, you might have, for example, the left side that's involved on one day, and then the next week, you might have the right side that's involved on the other day. Again, this is a childhood onset, so typically actually infantile onset condition. So you would not see this in presenting for the first time in an adult. Some of the additional characteristics, we've spoken already about the alternating hemiparesis. Patients can have dystonia, which is involuntary muscle contraction, and as well as abnormal eye movements, typically starting before 18 months of age. Now, episodes can vary in duration for anywhere from minutes to hours and are triggered by fasting, stress, and illness. One of the hallmarks of AHC is that symptoms improve with sleep. And many patients with AHC have some degree of developmental delay or cognitive impairment. And that's important to keep in mind as we think about the differential diagnosis, which we'll come to at the end of this video. AHC is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. And just to note, most cases are de novo or new in the affected individual. The cause is variants in ATP1A3, which is a subunit of the sodium potassium ATPase that's expressed in both neurons and cardiac cells. And of note, Three recurrent missense variants account for about 60% of all cases of AHC. So there certainly are hot spots that are affected in this gene and that result in AHC. The sodium potassium ATPase helps maintain the resting potential of neurons as well as cardiac pacemaker cells. Now, the structure of the ATPase is shown here on the right. And on top, we have the extracellular fluid. And on the bottom, we have the intracellular cytoplasm. And you can see that the ATPase sits at the interface between these two environments and shuttles sodium and potassium between these two compartments. Now, when you have an imbalance of these ions, such as when you have a variance in ATP1A3 that causes this ATPase to not work as well, you can end up with abnormal polarization of these neurons. So these neurons and cardiac pacemaker cells may not work as well. And this can lead to dysfunction of both of these organs. So leading to the hemiplegia, um, as well as seizures that are eventually developed in a number of these patients. Patients with AHC typically have a normal brain MRI. If you were to do an EEG during one of these spells, you might see contralateral slowing. So the opposite side compared to what's being affected in the body. So for example, if the left side of the body is paralyzed, you'd expect to see slowing of the right half of the brain. Now these are different from seizures. These spells are different from seizures, which you would could also detect on EEG, but would be different and independent from these spells. Flunarazine, which is a calcium channel blocker, can help reduce the severity and frequency of these spells. Patients should also avoid any known triggers and stick to a regular sleep schedule. Even though AHC was typically thought of as a primary neurologic disease. About 60% of these patients have been shown to have baseline abnormalities on their ECG 
with a small percentage of them actually requiring intervention with, for example, a pacemaker. And about half of all patients with AHC will end up developing seizures at some point in their life. Now, there are two other ATP1A3 related neurologic disorders. So this is truly a, a spectrum. So you can certainly have overlap between some of these different syndromes. But just to mention these other two defined syndromes. So the first is rapid onset dystonia Parkinsonism or RDP. So you can think of this as a individual who all of a sudden wakes up one morning and can't talk can't walk and can't eat. So that's kind of scary. And that's what tends to happen in these patients. The onset is either in childhood or in adulthood. And unfortunately, the symptoms typically do not improve, although they often stabilize so they don't get worse, but they don't get any better. Kapos is the other ATP1A3 related disorder. And those symptoms you can see here, the ataxia, areflexia, pes cavus, optic atrophy, and hearing loss. The distinguishing feature here is the presence of ataxia or weakness following a fever. This typically presents in a child, so somewhere between six months and four years of age. And of note, capos can be progressive as well. But again, the takeaway here is that these disorders exist on a spectrum and are not truly distinct clinical entities. This is a figure from GTEx, which is a collection of gene expression data. We have the expression levels along the y-axis and the tissues along the x-axis. And you can see that the gene ATP1A3 is expressed both in the brain in yellow, as well as in the heart in pink, but not really in any of the other tissues. Whenever you have a patient presenting with episodic paralysis, there's a couple of other conditions that you want to think about. Now, one of the main distinguishing features between AHC and these three disorders listed here is the presence of cognitive involvement. So typically patients with AHC will have some degree of cognitive difficulty cognitive impairment, whereas patients with hypo or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis will not. In addition, the patients with hypo or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis will have bilateral weakness that is episodic or periodic compared to AHC where you have unilateral weakness, so affecting either the left or the right half of the body. In familial hemiplegic migraine, the key distinguishing feature here is the presence of migraines. And in particular, the hemiplegia tends to proceed, so to come right before the migraine. And this timing is characteristic, this order of symptoms is characteristic of familial hemiplegic migraine. Patients tend to present beyond infancy, so typically not in a six-month-old or a 12-month-old. And again, the patients will not have cognitive impairment classically in familial hemiplegic migraine. The other thing you'd want to consider is the presence of an ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke due to any number of causes. Whenever you have a patient presenting with paralysis, particularly if it's on one side of the body, you want to think about whether this patient could be having a stroke. And that's certainly an indication for some type of neuroimaging. There's a few studies that are ongoing related to ATP1A3 related disorders. Some of those links I have listed here. So there's a study in Buffalo as well as in London. So there's a broad interest in channelopathies, which are diseases affecting ion channels. And I've left the titles to a few recent papers talking about ATP1A3 related disorders here. If you found this video useful, please like, subscribe, and share. You can also subscribe to my weekly newsletter with board style questions.
for GenX exams. And you can also buy me a coffee to show your support for the channel. Thank you.